living in the last moments of Earth's history. God is going to set up His kingdom on Earth. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand to reach every hamlet, every village, every man, every child, every person in India, every person in South America must hear these three angels' messages. These are stories that illustrate the kind of fabric of character and perseverance that we need to go through the tribulation just as certainly as they did. The Bible makes it very clear we are living in an unusual hour. The last grains of sand are trickling through the hourglass of time, and the door of probation is about to swing shut. Tonight's message I've entitled, Your Seventh Hour Miracle. Your Seventh Hour Miracle. Take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. What book of the Bible? Revelation chapter 14. It's the centerpiece of the book of Revelation. 404 verses, 22 chapters, all inspired, all relevant for the last hours of verse history. Revelation 14, looking there at verse 12. It is a pivotal passage, and it sets the pace and tone for tonight's topic, your seventh hour miracle. Revelation 14, verse 12. Can we thunder this out together? Let's do it. Here we go. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, there's three elements there, and they're all intimately connected. They're really inseparable. Notice these three elements. Number one, here is the what of the saints? The patience, the word patience there could be properly rendered perseverance or perseverance or endurance. Everybody say endurance, you know? How many have ever watched a marathon? You know, I'm, I don't really track with sports. I don't really watch sports that much. Uh, number one, I'm too busy. Number two, if you're for a particular team, I've learned from hard uh, you know, hard experiences in the past that if you root for, say, the Chicago Bears like I used to years and years and years ago, well, you're one day up and one day down. So I just said, forget it. I just don't like that. But let me tell you something. We are living in the last moments of verse history, and this is no game. This is the real deal. We need to be ready for heaven. We need to be ready when Jesus comes in all his glory. And there's only one thing we take to heaven. It's our character. And we must develop a character by overcoming. And an element we need there is endurance. So I don't really follow sports that much. But when it comes to endurance, immediately my attention is riveted upon the, the, the illustration of a marathon or runner a person that does a sprint, a, a, a quarter mile or a mile. I admire those who have endurance to run and some that can run long distances. I have a friend, Leo Scriven, who just walked across the United States of America in 100 days. Only other, a handful of other people have ever done that in 100 days, and he landed on his 50th birthday. And now my son and I and my wife, uh, not so much Jordan, are kind of thinking, hmm, do we want to do this? But uh, I'm a little over 50. But uh, anyway, endurance. We need endurance. And the illustration of physical endurance is an illustration of how we need to have spiritual endurance. And even Paul talked about a spiritual race that we are in. I want you to go there with me, and then we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. We're going now to the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Are we in a race to the close? That's right. And the book of Revelation showcases a group of people in the last days that have developed an element of their character of perseverance. In other words, they a character is who you are. And God is going to have a people who in their very innermost soul are people who say, I will never give up because I have Jesus. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to press on. I'm going to make it. I'm going to be an overcomer. And so look here at uh, Hebrews. Hebrews, all right? 
Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures tonight. Hebrews chapter 12. And notice the illustration that Paul uses in the context of perseverance. Does the book of Revelation say that God will have a people that must persevere the patience of the saints, the endurance of the saints? Notice here in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us what? Run with what? Endurance. Come on, yell it out. Endurance. Endurance the race that is set before us. So Paul says, you're in a race, and you got to endure. you got to make it to the finish. How? How are we going to make it? How are we going to persevere? Let me just throw it out immediately to you. We are going through the tribulation. We're going to go through the final crucible of trial before Jesus comes. We need to develop the muscle of faith. We need to have a character that is unshakable uh, with the help of Jesus. How many agree? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Now look at this. Looking unto Jesus, the author, that is the originator, and the finisher, the finisher, or the perfecter, the developer, he finishes what he starts. Paul said, you can have confidence that he who has begun a good work in you will finish it. That's Philippians 1.6. Are we living in the last days? Yes, we are. So would you agree, whatever he's doing with the saints, he is doing finishing touches. Amen? I'm going to agree. Whatever he's doing to our character, this is it. This is it. Whatever he is doing with our character, he is doing a very quick work. And so the Bible says here, looking unto Jesus, this is how we persevere. The author and finish of our faith. So what is going to be perfected before we finish the race? Our faith. Does this make sense? Our faith must be perfected before we finish the race. But some are teaching you, and false prophets and false preachers, Jesus said they would abound, that no, just Jesus just come and snatch you away. You don't have to endure tribulation. But the tribulation is preparation for translation. Because we must develop a character that is prepared to go through the tribulation, which is the preparation for the graduation. You know, we all want the graduation. Lord, just take me home. And some do pass away before that tribulation. I, I don't know about you, I want to be alive when Jesus comes, amen? Now, if the Lord should see, to, see fit that I would be laid to rest before the tribulation begins, but let me tell you, it's around the corner. But uh, that's his, whatever His will is, so be it. But I want you to notice this. Endurance, the race that is set before us. How? Look to Jesus. He's perfecting your faith. Did we read about, first element was perseverance. Second element was they keep the commandments of God. And the third element, can you remember that? Faith of Jesus. That's right. The faith of Jesus. So do you see the faith of Jesus and endurance in the context here of Hebrews 12? Yes. So there's a parallel. Enduring faith. A faith that says, I'm not giving up. It's not in my vocabulary. How many agree? The devil knows if in the back of your mind you have a reservation that says, okay, if certain things happen, if a certain scenario is developed, that's when I say, that's enough. I, I can't handle this anymore. I'm giving up. How many agree? The devil knows if you have that, a button that he can push. He knows if in the back of your mind he can create certain circumstances in which you would say, forget it, I throw in the towel. But it, God wants to develop a people that say, you know what, I don't care how dark it gets, I'm going to learn to have a song in the night. It says that in Psalms 32, I believe it is. And Anyway, you can check it out in the scriptures. I want you to notice here. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, Will God's people have to go through the cross? There is a parallel 
between the final days of Christ's life and the final days of his remnant, his people in the last days. There is a striking parallel. Jesus was persecuted. God's people would be persecuted. Jesus went through an unfair trial before a corrupt government. What do you think? You think the government in the last days is going to be nice and pure and and so let, let me tell you something. A corrupt government gave in to pressure from a corrupt church. Right? These were corrupt religious leaders putting pressure on corrupt political leaders, and they persecuted Jesus. Will that scenario have a dreadful deja vu or repeat performance? It will. It will. So in other words, we need to have, what does the Bible say? The faith of Jesus. Because what he went through, we're going to go through. But he said, in the world, you're going to have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome, John 16, 33. So what is he saying? I went through it. Jesus said in John 15, I think it's around verse 12, he says, if they hated you, or if they uh, hated me, you know they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, you know they're going to persecute you. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. He said, Mark, I was fine until I stumbled in here tonight. I'm going through daily tribulations. You're telling me about another tribulation coming my way. But listen, you know how you can endure your daily tribulations? Is when you see the big picture and you realize, ultimately, he's going to pull you through it all. You're going to stand on the sea of glass being an overcomer. Would you like to see that? Would you like to see that anyway? Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's just keep reading. For consider, In other words, look to Jesus at his throne. He made it. Everybody say that with me. He made it. Come on, shout it out. He made it. Therefore, you can make it. He made it. You can make it. Because the same spirit of Jesus dwells in us. Amen? He's an overcomer. We are an overcomer because his spirit dwells in us. And so I want you to notice here. Hebrews 12, verse 3. For consider him who endured. There it is. Jesus endured. You can endure. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Do you know why the disciples kept falling asleep? The Bible tells us. Does anybody know? You know why? It says they were sorrowful. And when you get discouraged and depressed, you really don't feel like praying. But that's the time to pray or be an easy prey. And so I want you to notice here, it says here, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So what is he saying? Paul is saying here, if you feel like giving up, Look at what Jesus went through. Come on, you haven't sweat blood, Paul says. In other words, what's the idea? Endure. What's a theme, an overarching theme, a theme that is woven throughout the golden pages of Revelation? The theme is this. You must overcome to be saved at last. Overcoming sin, self, and Satan through the Scriptures, through the Word of God. This is how Jesus overcame. Now take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 15. I know, you know we're going somewhere with this. The Holy Spirit is, is here tonight. Amen. And look at Revelation chapter 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have gotten the what? Victory over the beast over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. Standing, standing on the sea of glass. You know, there's, there's the sea of glass and there's a lake of fire. Would you agree? We're, go, we're all going to something. Either the sea of glass or the lake of fire. The book of Revelation is a series of stark, sharp contrasts. You got Babylon, you got Jerusalem. You got the mark of the beast, you got the seal of God. You got the dragon, you got the lamb. You got the harlot woman, you got the pure woman. You got 666, you got sevens. I mean, on and on and on. There's a list there. Why? Because there's only two groups. There are those who are saved and those who are lost. And we must make a, a choice. And so notice here, it says here, they're going to get the victory. 
So how can you stand on the sea of glass at last? you got to have victory. you got to have victory. Now, I'm so glad that if we fail, what does the Bible say? 1 John 2, verse 1. Beloved, I write to you that you may not sin. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Does that give you some good news? Don't sin. But if you do make a mistake, ask him for forgiveness and move on. Can you say amen? That's 1 John 1 and uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. <clears throat> now listen, what book are we focusing in on right now? The book of Revelation. Does the book of Revelation say, in order to make it to the sea of glass, you've got to have victory? In other words, you're going to go through the tribulation. So the Bible makes it very clear. There's tribulation, and that is purification and preparation for the graduation, the glorification, when we get a brand new body in translation. All right, is that enough? Can I make it simple? Prepare for the tribulation because the tribulation is preparation for the coming of Christ. And I, I keep repeating myself because repetition is a key to retention. And I want this to be so simple a child can understand it. A major theme in the scriptures is you got to be an overcomer. So you need an overcoming, enduring, persevering faith. And that needs to become who you are. Here is the patience of the saints. Here they are. They got that character. Here is the patience of the saints. Listen, here are they that have the faith of Jesus. Jesus overcame. I want you to notice here, Revelation. So, so notice here, do we have to overcome the beast and his image and his mark and his number? Do we need to be an overcomer? Absolutely. How? Through Jesus Christ alone. Because Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. So I want you to notice here. I want you to notice we must be an overcomer. Can I give you positive proof that we are going through the tribulation? Look at Revelation 16, verse 15. In the context of the sixth plague, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What is this saying? It's saying, Jesus is saying, I'm coming as a thief. Wait. It's in the context of the sixth plague. So what is he saying? I'm coming after the plagues. I'm coming after the tribulation. I'm coming after I purified your character. No wonder it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, that everyone who has a hope in the coming of Jesus Christ purifies himself even as he is pure. Because the confidence we have is that when Jesus comes, we are like him. Now, he can do it. He's the Alpha and Omega. How many agree? He can do it. Nothing is impossible with God. He can perfect your character. So don't be discouraged. If you fail, you ask for forgiveness, and you forget the things that are behind, and you press on, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, to the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. What is that high calling? Everybody say high calling. What is the high calling? It's, it's spotlighted there in the book of Revelation to develop a character, to put on the robe of Christ's life. Our goal, saints, is to be like Jesus. And we must have an overcoming faith to be like Jesus. Now I'm going to make this more practical as we proceed. Very practical. You'll notice in this seminar we combine two things in our preaching and teaching and Bible study investigation. Number one, prophetic. Number two, practical. Because if you don't get the practical, the prophetic will scare you to death. Amen? But remember, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And the Lamb wins. And those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, Revelation 14, they prevail with Him. They go through the tribulation. Notice here, it says here, Jesus says, that he's coming as a thief after the tribulation, after the plagues are poured out. So he says there, hold on, don't give up your trust in my righteousness. Keep your garments on. Well, how many agree? In ourselves, we're naked. But we put on Christ's righteousness, how? 
by faith. So what he's saying there, don't give up your faith. Hold on, because the devil will try to use the tribulation to shake our faith. But instead, it'll strengthen our faith. How many agree? The more the devil throws stuff at you, the more you get strong in Jesus because you cry out to Jesus and you say, Lord, I can't deal with this infuriated foe. Protect me. Put on the whole armor of God. If you are going through a personal crisis in your life, if you are facing financial challenges, if you are suffering from a health problem, if your marriage is needing a miracle, if you have a special concern for your children, whatever your need may be, give us a call and we will pray with you. For your prayer requests, call us at 1-855-336-FREE. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. John 8:36. Let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 3. Are we going through the tribulation? That's clear evidence, positive proof. Revelation 3 verse 10, because you have kept the, uh, my command to persevere, to persevere, don't give up. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test. Test what? Their faith. Their faith. The faith that leads to obedience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. Now watch this. It says here, to test those who dwell on the earth. The global showdown test is coming. We are racing towards that final exam before our graduation. Is this making sense? Now, I want, you to sh want to show you something else. We must overcome. We must be an overcomer. Amen? Look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, looking here at verse 14. And I said to him, Sir, you know... So he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of great, what? Tribulation and washed their robes. What's their robes? That's their character. And made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they had a robe of light. But when they sinned, that robe of light was gone and they felt nothing but what? Naked. Did they feel naked before that? No. In other words, they were clothed. Not literally, but they were clothed with that, with that spiritual light, that connection with God. So when it talks about, you know, being clothed, would you agree that is we're connected with God? We trust in Jesus, our righteousness. In other words, we're not looking to ourselves. We know we're naked. So we're looking to Jesus and we're taking hold of his righteousness. We're saying, Jesus. Uh, you are worthy. I worship you. I look to you. I trust in you. I want to live for you. I want to look like you. I want to talk like you. I want to act like you. I want to be one with you, follow you. Amen? It's all about Jesus. The book of Revelation has scary beasts, ominous numbers, harlot women, lake of fire, terrible seven last plagues, and then there's Jesus all throughout the book of Revelation. The term lamb, for example, is used about 29 times in the book of Revelation. What is that telling us? It's telling us that Jesus is the star of Revelation. Amen? And he's the star that never goes out. And he's called the morning star. And so I want you to notice here, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the remnant, who keep the commandments of God. And they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the devil is angry. He's enraged. He makes war against these people. Why? Because they're uplifting the commandments of God. Now watch this. It will soon be against the law to keep God's law. See, I'm talking about the nature of tribulation. I'm talking about preparation for the tribulation, which is purification for the second coming of Christ. So watch this. You must know that there's a war launched against us. We are on the devil's target list. But guess what? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now that's overcoming language. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, verse 4. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. In other words, in the last days when the very fabric of our faith is tested, it's tested to see, do you have a faith 
that's in the Word of God or are you putting faith in your feelings and, and, and your circumstances and things that you can see? Because the Bible makes it very clear. Before Jesus comes, you won't be able to buy or sell if you refuse the mark of the beast. Would you agree? That sounds like tribulation stuff. There'll be a swift, harsh death decree issued against those who say to the government, I'm not going along with this mark of the beast. And they'll say, okay, we're going to kill you. That sounds like tribulation stuff. But the Bible says he will never leave us, nor forsake us. Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, verse 20. Now watch this, watch this. I want you to notice the devil launches a war against the faithful, against God's people. He makes a war. What is the nature of that war? It is expanded in the next few verses. Revelation 12, 17 introduces the prophetic scenario of two beasts that the dragon uses to assault, attack, and harass, and oppress, and make war against God's people. And these two beasts, the first beast is the papal power. Now, we've had a couple of presentations in which we have exposed the sinister Antichrist, and the Protestant reformers were right. They pointed, using Scripture unerringly, to the, the Antichrist being categorically affirming this, the Roman papal system. Now, this may be new, but the apostate religious system, the, this apostate professed, uh, Christian church that has many wonderful people that have been impacted by it, this is, as the Protestant reformers and even King James himself, this is none other than Antichrist. And the Bible says you must overcome the Antichrist. And Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 and 4, he said, before we're gathered together to go to be with the Lord, we are going to have to be confronted with and overcome the man of sin, the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. So sequence is very important. We need to get the prophetic timetable and sequence of events very clear in our mind, to wrap our mind around it. Number one, we are living when so many signs of the times are happening, unfolding before our mind in political world, social world, environmental world, economic world, religious world, social world. I'm going to agree, it's just, it's just wild, amen? It's kind of like the weather, wacky and wild and unpredictable. That's the way our world is. I'm going to agree, you go to bed tonight, you don't know what you're going to wake up to tomorrow and, and, and some game changers, some paradigm shifts. Uh, uh, you know, you just don't know. And so listen, my Bible tells me the devil has launched an all-out assault. Because in Revelation 12, 12, it says the devil knows his days are numbered and he's come down to the earth with great wrath, knowing that his time is short. And Jesus said the night comes when no man can work. John 9, verse 4. So how many agree? We've got to get the gospel out because people are becoming more gospel-hardened. How many agree? People are becoming like Pharaoh. And because Pharaoh was so hard-hearted, the plagues fell. That's going to be repeated. When people become like Pharaoh, they get the mark of the beast and they get the, they get the plagues. But God's people are going to become more like Jesus. And they're going to shine for Jesus. And they're going to glorify Jesus and preach Jesus. And they don't care about what man says. They say, well, we're going to kill you. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to go with Jesus. You won't be able to buy or sell. I'm going to follow Jesus. I want you to notice here in Revelation 13, the second beast, we'll identify that in the subsequent presentation, but I'll blurt it out. It's the United States of America. Now, I'll back it up in a future presentation, but the United States and the Vatican are going to work together to enforce the mark of the beast. That's coming up. That's coming up. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell economic boycott except those, except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So in other words, what it's saying there, if you're not politically correct, you're going to be oppressed. There'll be an oppressive uh, uh, law with some teeth in it that says you cannot worship the Creator and keep His commandments you must worship the beast and keep the changed commandments. 
You see, in the last days, the issue is, who really loves Jesus? How many agree there's a whole lot of Christians today that profess to love Jesus? Can you imagine if every person in the United States of America that professed to love Jesus really did love Jesus? I'm here to tell you, we'd feel like we had a little heaven on earth. But instead, we have a little bit of hell on earth. Because the Bible says in the last days, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, that people would have a form of godliness, but no power. You read it there, 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 5. And that's why the Bible says perilous days will come. It's right there in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. Now look at verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now let me ask you this. Do we need to have a persevering faith in the last days? Yes or no, to persevere. Who can you think of? that was translated after going through a tribulation and having a strong prayer life of faith. And he was translated without seeing death. And he's a type of the church at the close. And we need to have that kind of faith. His name is Elijah. Elijah is a type of the church. I got a whole other presentation dealing with the return of Elijah. And what does that mean? But I will tell you this. The Bible makes it very clear that God will have modern Elijahs that, like Elijah, go through their tribulation, have the state government and the apostate church going against them. Ahab and Jezebel, what a conspiracy. What a, what a, a marriage made in hell. And uh, there, there they are. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel said, we're going to kill Elijah. And Elijah was on the run. He went through a tribulation. But he delivered the last message of mercy. He delivered a very strong rebuke. His message was a message of judgment for the government and for the church. He was unabashed. His message was very straight and clear. Get back to God. Get back to God. And, uh, and you remember, you remember that Elijah was persecuted. Now you remember. He was known to be a man of prayer. Take your Bible and turn with me to James. James chapter, James chapter 5. Do we need to have a faith in the last days, brothers and sisters? We need to have a faith. The faith of Jesus, amen? And the faith of Elijah. The faith of the patriarchs and prophets. That's why you read Hebrews chapter 11. It's known as the hall of faith. <laughs> amen? We got to have faith. You know, you see these advertisements that say, got milk, and they have a milky mustache. Hey, how about got faith? Amen. James chapter 5. Look here now at verse number, number uh, 16. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man like Elijah avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Now notice the next part. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Do we need that kind of faith in the last days in order to be translated with a character that is ready for heaven? How many agree? Elijah's character was ready for heaven. Otherwise, he would not have been taken to heaven. I'm going to agree. God got him ready. He didn't do that on his own. As a matter of fact, at one point, he said, I don't even want to live. And God said, well, too bad, you're going to live. <laughs> I got work for you to do. By the way, you want an antidote to depression? Get to work. That's what Elijah was basically told. Elijah said, I don't feel like living, God. Just take my life. And God said, I've called you. Let's get to work. Isn't God wise? All wise? He knows exactly what to do with being in a cave of darkness. You don't stay there. You've got to get out, and you've got to get your mind off yourself, and you've got to work. You want to? And, and let me tell you something. Talk about a comeback. Would you agree? He didn't even want to live. He was depressed. Right? Now he's in heaven. I say that's an amazing comeback to go from depression, not even wanting to live, and now he's in heaven. 
Good thing he didn't take his life. Can you say amen? It's never too late while you're breathing. I want you to notice here that Elijah developed a character of faith. And it was revealed in his prayer life. Show me your prayer life and I'll show you whether you got faith or not. So this is the neat thing. And by the way, when you pray earnestly, it helps your faith. So it really goes together. Okay, I want to turn to a story real quick in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. All right? Verse 41. This is after the false prophets had been killed on Mount Carmel, after the Lord had answered by fire. You remember he said, let's have a showdown. The God who answers by fire, that is the true God. And God answered by fire, and the people said, we want to follow God now. And so since there was some repentance, then Elijah now prayed after three and a half years of drought. Now Elijah was going to go and pray for rain. There was preparation now for the rain. Now it was time to get the rain. And that is symbolic of the fact that we need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to notice here, by the way, Elijah prayed for his people and for his land that it wouldn't rain. I think we need to know how Elijah prayed and how, how would Elijah pray for our nation? Would he pray, Lord, just shower the blessings? Or would he pray, Lord, if it requires for you to take away the blessings here in America, in order for America to turn back to you, then so be it. And let me just tell you this, don't expect government to give you salvation. Only Jesus can. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is a sound, there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground, bowed down on the ground, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. Your seventh hour miracle. Now watch this. Watch this. How many want to how many want to go where Elijah went? Did he go through the tribulation? Yes or no? Did he have a persevering faith? Yes or no? But did he have a point in his faith where it bottomed out? And then God brought him back up again? Do you have faith now? All right. Now watch this. Watch this. Then Elijah said to Ahab, King Ahab, vacillating, spineless, wishy-washy, backslidden Ahab, who married the wrong woman, Jezebel. How many of you... I have named your daughter Jezebel. Anybody here? How many know anybody that is named Jezebel? That's a real name. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. Elijah, did he actually hear this, yes or no? Did he actually hear the rain? No. Was it beginning to rain when he said this? No. How did he hear that sound? By faith. This is powerful. Elijah declared something that he didn't hear, but he heard it by faith, and he declared it by faith. He declared it before it happened because he knew it would happen, but then he prepared that it might happen. Now watch this. I'm going somewhere. Didn't I tell you we're going to make it not just prophetic, but practical? I'm going to, I'm going to show you here with the help of the Holy Spirit. You need to have a faith that, 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 that circumstances cannot diminish. Elijah did not see or hear anything. But by faith, he knew he had done what he needed to do. Now, he knew he was going to go pray. So he said, Ahab, I hear rain. I hear the sound, what does he say here? Of abundance of rain. He says, I hear it. It's coming. It's coming. It's as good as here. I love how it says in Romans 4 that, uh, that God declares those things that shall be as though they already were. Hallelujah. That's when, you know, God showed me my wife after two miscarriages was going to have another baby. And my Jordan is here. 
as a testimony of declaring something in faith. I declared to relatives who were telling me, Mark, wake up. You're going to have to adopt. Your wife is up there in age. You're up there. You've already tried. <clears throat> you, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you know you, it's not going to work. Give it up. You're going to have to adopt. Nothing wrong with adopting, but God put it in my heart and spirit that we were going to have another baby. And I declared it. It looked silly. It looked crazy. Oh, yeah, this is Mark. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll come around. <laughs> he'll come around. Let me tell you something. What came around is when my wife came around and said, I'm pregnant. Ah, but wait a minute. Then we needed to pray, Lord, let this be the real deal, that, that this baby will come out. Because even if we had another miscarriage, I would wait. I'm here to tell you, the Lord promised me that we were going to have a baby, and I declared it, and I declared it. And when Jordan came forth, let me tell you something. It has boosted our faith. Caleb was a miracle child, and Jordan is a miracle child. And uh, I will tell you this. You need to learn how to declare a thing. In the book of Job, chapter 22, it says if you pray to God in faith, you can declare a thing. What does it mean to declare a thing? It means you declare something that God has put within your heart that he said is going to happen, and you speak it before it happens. Anybody can say, all right, I believe this pulpit is here. Very good. It's because you can see it. I believe that next week there's going to be a pulpit right here. You're going to have two pulpits. Well, if the Lord put that in your heart, which I don't think he's going to be doing, but if he put it in your heart and you know he showed that to you, he revealed that to you, and you declared it, probably a lot of people around here would say, this person is crazy. But when God puts something in your heart, with the heart, man believes, and with the mouth, confession is made with what you believe in your heart. Romans 10, because out of the heart, out of the heart shall flow rivers of living water that come from the word, and the word that's in us, we speak it. It's the word of faith. Come on now. you got to speak something. You see, if you have faith, if you have faith like Elijah, you always have something you're looking forward to. Why we can look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ, getting a brand new body. Interested? Living forever with Jesus? So the Bible makes it very clear that faith has an buoyancy in it. Faith has an expectancy in it. Faith says, I've got something to look forward to. So faith is always pregnant. And you know, when you see a woman... Pregnant, and she tells you she's pregnant, you don't ask, you think she's going to have a baby? Come on now, she's pregnant. You know it's coming out sometime. You might have to go in and get it out, but it's coming out. So listen to me. Elijah said, I hear what I've been longing for. What this, what this, what this people of God needed more than anything was to see God in power. He answered by fire, and now he was going to answer by rain, all because one man, Elijah, a lone, rugged, ragged, wilderness prophet like John the Baptist, was willing to stand up for God. Sudden changes are about to catch the world by surprise. Amazing Bible prophecies are fast fulfilling. Do ancient prophecies predict a sudden economic collapse? Will the Middle East crisis erupt into World War III? Are we living on the eve of Armageddon? How will the final moves of the Antichrist affect you? What is the future of the United States of America? How will natural disasters usher in the mark of the beast? Now you can watch the entire Amazing Prophecy series of 32 hope-filled messages on DVD. Don't guess about the future, know the future. The complete set of DVDs is available for a gift of $60 or more. Call us at 1-855-336-FREE or you can send a check or money order to Forever Free Ministries, 2001 Monroe Park, Corinth, Texas, 76208.
You can also visit us online at foreverfreeministries.org. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. In other words, he's humbling himself. Here's great Elijah down on his face. How many agree if you seek the Lord in secret, He'll reward you openly, Matthew 6, 6. Listen to me. It says here, He bowed his, down His face to the ground. How many agree? Pride must go if you want to see a seventh hour miracle. Everybody wants a miracle, all right? Are you willing to pay the price? All right, get down in the dirt. Get low before God. If you humble yourself, in due time He'll exalt you. Can you say amen? Everybody wants exaltation. Everybody wants, you know, glory and bliss and blessings and miracles. The way to prepare for your seventh hour miracle is to do what Elijah did. Declare that he's going to answer. That's praise. What things soever you desire. When you pray, believe that you receive them. You shall have them. In other words, declare, I have it. Thank you, Jesus. I have it. Before you see it and you realize it. That's faith. And that's the kind of faith we will need. When they say you can't buy or sell, we're going to kill you. God's not going to let all of his people be wiped out. Don't worry. He's not going to. Some, there'll be some martyrdom, I'm sure. Or is there not some martyrdom out there in the world today? So listen to me. We need to have a faith that says, I don't care what I can see. They're taking things away from me. They're threatening me. But my faith declares a thing. Lord, you're going to come and you're going to rescue us. And just in time, in the seventh hour, as it were. And by the way, the seventh hour is your finest hour. I'm going to agree. The finest hour is when Jesus comes to take his bride home. But his bride will be purified. Ephesians 5 makes that clear. I want you to notice here, I want you to notice here. The Bible says here, and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there's nothing, there's nothing. How many times can you hear nothing, nothing? You're praying the same prayer like a broken record and nothing, 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 nothing. I mean, there's only so many ways you can say nothing. Nothing, 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 <laughs> nothing. It's kind of like looking for a job. Job is taken, job is filled. Not interested, we'll call you if we're interested. <laughs> Listen. There is nothing. But he kept on praying. Seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time. What is the chief number of God throughout Scripture? Number seven. Seven is associated with God testing his people. Oh, he can use other numbers, but seven is a special number of completion and perfection. What does he want to perfect? Our character. What does he want to complete? <clears throat> he who has begun a good work in you will finish it. He wants to complete the work he's doing in you. You can have your seventh hour miracle. You can have all that he says. And let me tell you something. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20. And you know what the context is? To know the love of Christ. That's, that's, what, that's what the saints are going to learn. They're going to learn, wow. I never dreamed. I knew God loved me, but look at what he's brought me through. Here are those who came out of great tribulation, and they can sing a song. The Bible says they're going to sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Why? Because they can sing a song nobody else can sing. We went through it. He helped us through it. Oh, the love of God. Shall tribulation separate us from the love of God? No. Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39 says, Paul says, Shall tribulation separate us from the love of God? He says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I'm here to tell you, he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24, verse 13. 
verse 13, but Jesus is our endurance. He is our perseverance. How many agree? If he's in you, he doesn't give up. Your flesh says, give up. And the spirit says, you see, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. How many agree? Jesus in you does not give up. So just let him do what he wants to do. The pressure, you now must put it on Jesus. Say, you don't know how much pressure I'm under. Put it on Jesus. Doesn't Jesus say, cast all your cares upon me? And so look here. Look here. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand. Now, come on now. Is that really something to get all excited about? I don't know what was the demeanor, the facial expressions, the tone, the, all the wording that the servant used. But all I know is he came back, and I can imagine him saying, well, Master, you know, I think he was basically saying, you know, it's not much, but I'll tell you what I saw. I'm just reporting that I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. Hmm? Do you see that there? came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand. Elijah didn't dispatch him and say, well, no, you go back, and when that thing is a monster, when it's massive and you start to feel some rain, then bring me the report. Otherwise, I'm not getting excited about anything. Elijah had a faith. He declared something was going to happen, and when he saw just the slightest evidence that it was coming, he began the celebration. How many can see that Jesus is going to come soon? And you can see in the sky, look up, your redemption draws nigh. Then get excited and get ready. How many can see that that the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out in the early and latter rain before Jesus comes. Joel chapter 2, Hosea 6, Zechariah. The Holy Spirit's going to be poured out greater than on the day of Pentecost. I can hear the rain, can you? Can you hear the rainy season coming? How many agree? It's time for a rainy season in God's pe- among God's people. This is your seventh hour miracle. Listen. Notice here. And it came to pass the seventh time, the seventh time, that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up to say uh, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Can you say, pumped up. Doesn't the Bible say if you wait on the Lord, you can run and not be weary? Did he wait on the Lord? Physically, he was, I I believe this is more spiritual than physical. I mean, the man was so inspired. I don't know, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. What's the point here? The point here is that Elijah stayed persistent and persevering with his prayer. And that's how you overcome. You have an enduring faith, and that must first show up in prayer, and then it will show up everywhere. In other words, our greatest victories are in prayer with God. We must take hold of the Lord. Come on now, make your prayer list, and then storm the gates of heaven and say, Lord, these are my financial needs. Does he care? He talks so much about money, I think he does care about money. Lord, here are my financial needs. Lord, here are my health needs. You think he cares about health? Come on now, what did he do almost every day of his public ministry? Healed, healed, restored sickness, restored the sick. Come on now, somebody's going to get a faith here tonight. So finances, health, marriage, parenting. Does he care about that? Let the little children come to me. Where is the first miracle that he worked? at a marriage celebration. Come on, my Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. So what's the point? Jesus said this. This is powerful. 
Jesus said this. He said to one person, he said, what do you want me to do for you? What a scripture. Powerful scripture. I think that's Mark 10, 32. Anyway, he said, what do you want me to do for you? Oh, beloved, I, one of my favorite subjects to preach about in the context of Bible prophecy is faith. Because my Bible tells me in the book of Revelation, you must overcome. But you only can overcome by faith in Jesus. In what he has done. How many have some faith in what he has done? How many have faith that he did die for you? How many believe what he is doing? He's pleading his blood right now for you and he loves you and he's with you. How many believe and have faith that he is coming for you? How many agree? This is an overcoming faith. He's interceding for me. He's coming for me. You must have a strong faith that says, whatever the devil throws at me, it's only temporary. It's only temporary. This too shall pass. I want you to notice here, beloved. Take your Bible and turn with me to Luke 17. I want to show you very quickly what the Lord showed me this morning when I got up. Luke 17, verse 5. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Would you agree? We must have the faith of the saints to go through the tribulation of the saints that we go through in the last days, according to the book of Revelation. We must have a faith like Jesus. We must have a faith like Elijah. We shall overcome. We can make it. We shall stand on the sea of glass. We will have an overcoming faith. We cannot fail. We will not give up. Can you say amen? Look at Luke 17, verse 6. Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say. What Jesus is saying is if you have a little bit of faith, you can go around talking big. That's what he's saying. So if you hear Mark Fox go around sometime talking big sometimes, it's not because I'm all that. It's just because I believe that if I will talk faith, I will have faith. If I will pray in faith, I'll have more faith. And I don't know about you, I do want to make it. I do want to make it. I owe it to my wife and my children to not fail and go to heaven as a family together. And I only know one way. I have to have faith in Jesus Christ. Does the devil try to shake my faith? every day. So I have I've made up my mind with God's help. I cannot turn back. I can't look to the left, to the right like a horse with blinders. There's one thing I must do. Forget the things that are behind and press on to be ready when Jesus comes in all his glory and to be found in his righteousness. Not a works righteousness, me trying to be good in my own strength, but you and I leaning on Jesus, trusting in Jesus, depending on Jesus, confiding in Jesus, hiding in Jesus. Although sudden and alarming changes are sweeping across the globe, you and your family can be prepared to face the future with confidence. The complete set of Amazing Prophecies on DVD are available for a gift of $60 or more. Call us at 1-855-336-FREE or send your check or money order to Forever Free Ministries, 2001 Monroe Park, Corinth, Texas, 76208. If you would like to have Mark Fox hold an Amazing Prophecy Seminar or a Marriage Seminar Weekend in your church, contact us today. Mark Fox at foreverfreeministries.org.